And I, I am just going to hit a few highlights. Um, uh, I realize that many of you probably don't really have a whole lot of Bermuda grass there that, you, that you're growing, but I do want to let you know about a few things that we're doing um, in Georgia. And, and to be clear, there's a lot of different Bermuda grass varieties that are out there. Some of these are going to be seeded varieties, and some of these are going to be hybrids. Uh, a lot of the hybrids that have been released have come from the program in Tifton. Um, and uh, many of those that, that were released from other states actually have some parentage that, that trace back to that uh, program at Tifton. Uh, Glenn Burton is really the father of uh, forage Bermuda grasses and that many of those that came out of his program are, are from him. So uh, very drought tolerant, very aggressive and very persistent, but it's a, lot, a whole lot of fertility that is required there. Real quickly, I'm gonna go through um, uh, I do, do want to highlight if you are interested in specific varieties, we do have a publication that covers the majority of the major ones anyway that, uh, uh, that are out on the market, including a few of the seeded varieties. There's some discussion about those, where they fit, where they don't fit, what are some of the characteristics of those. Um, I'm going to skip over most of this. Because I want to get to uh, one of the major things with Bermuda grass is fertility and in particular potash nutrition. If, uh, if you have a producer who is taking this off as hay, uh, it does not take but just a few years of neglecting potash till you end up with a scenario like this. So this picture was taken early one morning with a lot of dew on and what's actually showing up here is the crabgrass. Uh, the brown material here and just a little bit of the green material, but most of this brown material is what used to be coastal Bermuda grass. So in this particular situa situation, they started having all these symptoms. It was just poor stress tolerance, a lot of leaf spot diseases, poor winter hardiness, and not very competitive. And eventually the stand was gone. And a lot of that boiled down to the lack of potash nutrition. And, and particularly our um, uh, introduced Warm season perennials have a huge need for potash. So some more data to kind of back that up. Uh, one thing about potash is, is that uh, grasses in general are luxury consumers of potash. And most of the potash that's available, whether we're talking about fescue or Bermuda grass or whatever it is, is going to be, most of that's going to be available in the spring of the year. And they will actually sometimes absorb so much of it then that they'll rob themselves of it later on in the season. Okay, so uh, I, I use the analogy of, uh, of going to a Chinese buffet, you know, you, you load that plate up with whatever you can eat and, and it's all you can eat, you know, all you can stand to eat. Uh, and if you can still walk as you walk out the door, then uh, you probably left a little bit on the table, <laughs> right? That's the way they, the grass approaches uh, potash nutrition as well. So uh, uh, put a little out in the spring. <clears throat> in the case of Bermuda grass, um, and, and really all of our warm season perennials, you really want to focus in on that later part of the season as, as it's preparing to go into dormancy. If you do go off the rails, you can recover that. Um, this is a study that was done in Texas where they, they had a stand that was about a 40% stand. After about three more years of no potash, they virtually had nothing out there. Uh, uh, three years of, of marginal potash and they were able to recover some, but three years of following the soil test recommendations, they were able to build back to where they needed to be in terms of a stand. So soil testing is very critical here. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if we are getting to a problem where we're looking at nutritional issues, we can do some tissue sampling to, uh, to measure in that top six inches of grass. And usually what I use is a rule of thumb, a literal rule of thumb here, because of the top of your thumb to the bottom of your fist, for the most part, is going to be about six inches, and uh, that's way that's the way that we can uh, uh, take a tissue sample and measure the mineral analysis of that and get an idea of what's going on. Especially if we sample both the bad zones and maybe a nearby good zone that's actually go growing well as a supplement to the soil test. Real quick, uh, just an update on some of the things we're doing with alfalfa in Bermuda grass and, and planting in some alfalfa into the Bermuda grass. For those of you that uh, uh, may be looking at interseeding uh, alfalfa into a grass, and in particular Bermuda grass, but others as well, you might find interesting what we're doing there. 
basically growing a supplemental crop with that. And, uh, and in this case, if all else fails, you still have Bermuda grass. So it really does work well for us. And yes, alfalfa will outcompete Bermuda grass. Believe it or not, it will. And in fact, uh, it produces somewhere in the no neighborhood of about 200 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, I'll let you all digest this, uh, this data a little later on, but um, the yields are, are quite good when we're putting those two together. Uh, row spacing, we talked about row spacing with the summer annuals, but it can also be important here with the uh, alfalfa and the Bermuda grass. And what I've generally been telling our producers is to go with about a 15 inch row spacing to leave a little gap there for the Bermuda grass to grow through. And I think that probably would be a fair statement to say about fescue as well, although I don't have as much data to back that up. Um, and especially if you're trying to get that Bermuda grass to survive underneath that alfalfa, uh, you really need to spread that row spacing out a little bit to be able to get that. So if you are going to try to do that, well-drained sites, all the things that we normally talk about for alfalfa establishment apply here. Planting at the right time of the year. Here's, here's a key difference is, is that we have to have that Bermuda grass short at planting. We have to go in and really buzz it back. And uh, we'll actually sometimes use a, a herbicide to burn that or frost it back, chemically frost it back. And then actually sometimes even go the extra step and burn off that, uh, that material with fire as well. Um, and then no-till drill it in. One thing that we have a problem with, and probably not as much of a problem here in Kentucky, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Ray, you might have a better sense of this than I, but uh, we have quite a bit of problem with insect damage to, uh, uh, <coughs> to alfalfa as it's coming up, and uh, many of these insects uh, tend to hide, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to hide out in the Bermuda grass. And so we have a real challenge with that, so we, we would go back in and, and treat that. I would treat. I would treat. And the reason being is, is there's, these are pyrethroids. They're $3 an acre for product cost, another $5 an acre to actually apply it. Um, it's cheap insurance at the end of the day uh, for, for, to protect an investment that's pretty sizable. You know, you're talking a few hundred dollars to, to get this established into Bermuda grass, at least a couple hundred dollars worth of seed. Uh, and so I would, I would choose to take that $8 and protect the 200 In this particular case, is just about a week after planting, okay. just as it's beginning to emerge. The problem is, is the, those mole crickets will come in and nip it off just as it's beginning to emerge, and if it nips that off, then it's game over for that particular seed. So, and honestly, I think you'll see that in some of the uh, uh, winter annual legume establishment issues that I think we've had over the years have really not. We blamed it on soil pH, and we blamed it on. Planting depth, and those certainly are, are key issues, but I think also we've had a lot of problems with insect damage coming up. And, and you know, those, those aren't as forgiving of that as, say, a grass would be. So. Uh, final topic on, on uh, uh, something that's been a major problem for us has been the Bermuda grass stem maggot. Um, what ends up happening with this is it's an insect, a fly that lays a larvae. Uh, or an egg that turns into larvae that bores inside of the stem and will kill out the top two to three leaves. Well, if it's, you know, if it's ready to harvest and the top two to three leaves are knocked out, it's no big deal. But if it's really short and it's just beginning to grow back, then this can be a real damaging fac factor. This is everywhere now that Bermuda grass has grown. In fact, there's reports of it in Kentucky as well. So uh, this has been uh, a challenge for us uh, uh, especially in, in the Bermuda grass belt. This is the fly and this is what it looks like as a scale here with a dime. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than a gnat, um, but it is a major problem. Um, there's more details here in the handout for you to, uh, uh, to pick up on. The, the, the females are three and a half millimeters long, the males are three millimeters long, and this is what they, they look like. The, the thing that we've been able to find with our research is uh, identifying the life cycle of this. So what we've been able to identify is that as soon as you cut that forage, if there's a, a, a larvae that's even remotely close to being able to survive, it's going to come out of, that gra out of that grass and go into the ground where it will pupate. And seven to ten days later, it will emerge. 
So if we can go in there with a pyrethroid insecticide seven to 10 days after cutting, we can do a pretty good job of killing those adult flies before they have a chance to uh, render a problem for us. And uh, that has worked pretty well. Not yet, but that is one of my biggest fears. And, and that's one of the reasons why <clears throat> there's also an opportunity for a second application or potentially a need for a second application. And I'm really trying to guard against that because I really don't want that second application out there to further risk the, uh, uh, the development of, of pyrethroid resistance. Are you making this application after each cutting or just one cutting a year? Or how We're how hoping you? that we, can only, we will only need to do this maybe twice a year. And it really doesn't start for us, it doesn't seem to overwinter, even in Georgia, it doesn't overwinter. Um, it, it really doesn't start to high populations until about mid-June. And so up in Virginia, you might not even see it until the end of July. But uh, for us, we really would, that's half of our growing season's already gone by the, by the first of July, for the most part on Bermuda grass. So. Uh, there are varietal differences here. I'm not gonna go into that because that is in your handout both in terms of uh, sheer numbers, but also in terms of percentage. That's one way that we can battle that. And it has to do with habitat. They much prefer a dense canopy than a thin canopy like this. Um, in, uh, in your handout is an outline of all the protocol here for those that may have some Bermuda grass in your area um, uh, that lays this out. The, the problem is, is if you get it just beginning to regrow and it gets hit then, that's when it's a problem. Uh, I talked about the pyrethroids, and, and the reason we like those is because they're cheap, but there are other chemistries out there, and we may be able to rotate those chemistries to, uh, to prevent there from being a buildup of population that is resistant to it, Tommy. But, you know, these things produce, there's, if our estimates have been approximately 400 to 500,000 flies per acre. So there's a huge population out there, and that's a ready-made recipe for resistance to build up. Uh, on a quick order. So uh, uh, I'm going to just uh, end with that. If you do have some specific questions about that, particularly if you have any producers that, uh, that you're running into in the southeast or whatnot that are dealing with this, this is a publication that's online that kind of goes over that. I apologize for the real brief look at that, but I realize that most of you all don't deal with Bermuda grass, so uh, this topic might have been just a, a little off the mark for you all, but um, any uh, questions, comments, or emotional outbursts? <laughs> I'd like to just, uh, could you mention the way seeded Bermuda grass is marketed in terms of uh, blends? Oh, example? yeah, 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 and it probably answers your question too about Wrangler. Um, so Wrangler, for example, is a, is a variety that uh, is a little bit more cold tolerant. Uh, honestly, for us, it's a dog. It, it hor it's a horrible variety for us. Never really has worked all that well. In, in, in Virginia also, it, it seems like it's more sensitive to environmental stresses than others. Yeah, like yeah. Now, David Ditch, I think, did some work with that over at Quicksand, and it did it, fairly it well. well. It does well for us. It's about two-thirds the yield of the, of the yeah. hybrids, but we've never lost it, even had any thinning due to winter. So particularly in this area of Kentucky, eastern and northern Kentucky, that's the main one we recommend. Mm -hmm. But in western Kentucky, a number of the other seeded types will do well. But right. about one in five years, we, we get some tough winter conditions for most of the seeded types. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to, to get back to Chris's question is, is that there's a, the, the forage production of these seeded Bermuda grasses is inversely proportional to the seed production it actually produces. Okay, so the more forage you get, the less seeds that you're normally going to get off these varieties as a general rule of thumb. So the better forage varieties produce so little seed that the seed companies will also oftentimes blend them with other seeded Bermuda grasses that just so happen to produce a lot of seeds, so their seed is cheap. So uh, there are many blends that are out on the market. In fact, most of the seeded varieties that you will find on the market are actually blends, generally speaking. Um, there are a few blends that I would recommend uh, to, to our producers at least, and, and uh, Chris could probably chime in with his experience in Virginia. But um, uh, the Rancho Frio is a variety or a blend that comes out of uh, uh, the Pennington uh, seed line. 
And then there's one called the Sun Grazer blends. And I forget who actually sells that one. But Sun Grazer is, uh, there are three components in Sun Grazer, and two of those are actually uh, varieties that have stood up really well in our test. Uh, KEF194 and uh, CD90160. So uh, both of those have done well. And then Rancho Frio has Cheyenne 2 in it, and Cheyenne 2 is really the, the one that seems to be the better um, uh, forage variety there. But again, those are going to be in blends. The challenge is, is that they usually will blend that with something like Giant. And Giant is a, is a variety of, of uh, common Bermuda grass. And uh, one of the challenges there is that Giant's really fast to get established. It's great big, and it may actually outcompete at least initially, some of the better varieties that are in that blend. So uh, sometimes weed challenges can be a problem there too. And, and, you, and it's the same.